All right, so hello everyone. I'm Daniel from Wolf Corp Robotics, and today this video will be on programming training, and it's week one for our six week long series. And so, of course, who says no to Java? All right, so before we get started, um, I'd just like to talk a bit about our team. And so, we're a fifth year FTC team, ninth year first team, and uh, we compete in the FTC competition or the first tech challenge. And FTC not only prioritizes uh, robots and programming, but also uh, really just communication skills, outreach, leadership, a lot of interpersonal things as well. And so our team's based in Walnut High School, and this past season, we've won the first place Inspire Award at Los Angeles. All right, so for this training overview, this is actually intended to be a kind of team training thing for our own team, and then we realized that we might as well record a bit and also make a uh, virtual version because we've back, been back in person for a bit now. And so we'll also be sending out these segments to for public viewing and hopefully someone can learn something from it. So the purpose of our training is to cover a high level overview and fundamental technical knowledge in Java and FTC robot programming. And since FTC robot programming is based in Java, they kind of go hand in hand. And so for this training overview, uh, no previous experience is needed but it's helpful to kind of have a general understanding of how computers work and how, and if you know a computer uh, programming language, that's awesome, but uh, it's not needed. And so this is gonna be kind of like a six week session that will be for our team actually, 10 to 12 p.m. But after these sessions, we'll be also releasing it out to public viewing, uh, hopefully on that Saturday or the following day. All right. So yeah, this week one, we'll be covering what FTC programming is and for our lab will be kind of just setting up your environment. All right, so to the lecture, we'll be talking about software and hardware programming, really just a general overview today, um, a lot of conceptual stuff. And so uh, what is programming? What is Java? So code can think about it as a language of machines. Usually when you speak to one person, you speak in English, but for something like when we're programming our FTC robots, we have to type code. And so for FTC, that's gonna be mostly Java. That's why we're teaching Java. And so Java is an object-oriented programming language. If you don't know what that means, it's completely fine. So basically you can think of object-oriented as um, everything when you write your program is an object or when you write classes or other code, it's all to build objects and each object has some properties and it can do some things, has some methods. Um, there's ways you can construct an object and yeah, it's kind of, this uh, paradigm, programming paradigm. And you might hear other ones like functional program, but you can kind of just, you know, go on YouTube and search up what is object programming or, into, or what are just kind of, there. I think there's seven programming paradigms or something like that you can search up. But um, yeah, so for Java, it's object oriented programming. And uh, because of the nature of Java, it's actually used for lots of things. So it's general applications, you see them everywhere. Uh, Java, you might have known, I can, do like, you know, web development stuff. You can build a web, there's web frameworks that are built for Java. So you can build websites even, um, you can make games. You can, so a lot of kind of things like Minecraft, a lot of people might play and yeah. And so the neat thing about Java is that it's a write once run anywhere kind of programming language, uh, programming development uh, environment as well. And so basically what that means is you can write your code on your computer once you uh, basically compile or you turn your code into a runnable format. And we'll talk about that on the next bullet point. But then after you turn your code into a runnable format, you can send it to any computer in the world. And this is what Java is designed for. You can send it anywhere uh, to any computer on the world. And it can basically just run it easily, uh, take whatever you have as it compiled. And uh, yeah, it makes it makes it pretty simple. Run once, run anywhere. All right, so running your programs. So when you, want to actually, so this is the compiler and runtime kind of uh, dealio. And so when you take your program and you want to compile it, and so you can run it anywhere, uh, there's, there's this difference. So when you first come, so it's split into two parts when you write, want your code to be run. So first there's a Java compiler and that Java compiler takes whatever code you ran or you wrote. And because you want it to make it cross platform, you can't just run it on your computer because then uh, each computer is different. So like something like a Mac versus a Windows um, versus a Linux operating system. So maybe something like Android, uh, they, they run in different ways. They, they, the computers are built differently. So you can't just take your Java code. And if you want it to run for one system, it might not work on another. So you kind of have, you have to go through like this process to 
make it able to run it anywhere. So kind of the compiler is kind of part of that. So you first take your Java code, which actually isn't understandable by the machine yet. And you first have to compile it, or you have to, you know, kind of take your code and turn it into something that they can understand. So machine or byte code and um, take that byte code. And then when you take that byte code, and then you can turn that eventually into machine code that can run on any computer. And the process of turning your Java code into this machine code is when you compile and and uh, yeah, it can, it, can it, it turns out the machine code turns out to be different kinds of, it turns out to be different on different systems because you know, if it wasn't different then it couldn't run. And so uh, when you actually compile it and you turn it into something the computer can understand and versus when the computer's actually running code, that's two differences. So the first is compiler and then the second is runtime. And so when you're actually coding, uh, there's actually these types of scenarios that you have to consider when compile time versus runtime and um, yeah, so when we go into Java programming next week, we'll get more in depth to that, but I guess that's just a preview. And so another neat thing, or another thing about Java is uh, static typing versus dynamic typing. So static typing is usually, uh, it basically says when you create a variable or when you create an object, since object oriented programming, when you create an object, uh, you have to assign the object to a certain type. You have to, so if you create, a, let's say an object of dog, you have to tell the you have to write in your program language and you have to tell the compiler and tell uh, then Java that it is a dog type and you can't just leave undefined. And so if you have had experience in other languages, maybe Python, you know that when you create a variable or when you create an object, it doesn't have to be a certain type. But for Java, you have to have that static type. And then we'll go and get later on into dynamic typing where the type can be changed. And when you get to more advanced topics in Java like polymorphism and inheritance and those kind of things, um, your type can, you, you can you still have to declare the type, but it can change. Uh, you can change the type and you can cast uh, objects and those kind of things. Um, and so we also have the Java development kit, Java runtime environment, Java virtual machine. And that's kind of how Java works really. That's like behind the scenes when you press, when you compile the Java code, um, that's what happens. And so uh, the Java development kit is for programmers to write code and develop Java programs. And usually you only see developers having that. And, but the Java runtime environment and Java virtual machine, um, by the way, if you see on the, on the right, Java development kit versus GRE versus JVM. The JDK contains all the JRE and JVM. The JRE contains also all the JVM. The JVM is just right there in the middle. And so usually when you're developing something, you want all three of them or you can't develop anything. But when you wanna just run programs, you're gonna to have to need the JRE and the JRE comes built in with the JVM. And very rarely do you only need the JVM. And so the Java development kit, that's for developing. GRE is to actually just run Java programs. So if you don't want to develop any programs, but you want to run programs, then you're probably going to need the GRE. And the Java virtual machine is um, is where you actually, uh, that's where the actual engine of the Java machine or of Java is. And that's what enables you to run the programs. And so GRE has also library files and other things. Um, it has basically, yeah, it, it contains additional features to pair up with the JVM to actually be able to run programs. All right. And so that's basically it for about Java. Um, and now we'll go more into kind of the FTC, the first tech challenge scenario for when you're trying to develop your robot programs. And so uh, you first start off with Android Studio. Android Studio is basically the established development environment. You see really any other IDE or integrated development environment that uh, programmers use in FEC, unless they're doing some kind of block code, they might be using like on bot Java. But if you don't have, you're using, not using those and you're really just developing uh, these Java programs, it's mostly the norm uh, to use Android Studio. And Android Studio actually development environment is not uh, something that Google built by themselves. So uh, it's actually based off IntelliJ and then the IntelliJ IDE. And so uh, here's that logo and here's the Android Studio logo. Um, and that's where you'll be running code. And inside the Android Studio, uh, you have the FTC SDK, or the FTC Software Development Kit. And that's where FTC provides basically this environment, this development kit, to be able to communicate with your robot. Because Android Studio is usually just used for building apps or building anything for like a wristwatch or a tablet or a smartphone. But uh, the FTC SDK enables us to write code specifically for FTC. And we'll eventually take that code and we'll download it technically as app or it'll be downloaded onto an app called the Robot Controller app. 
or onto the control hub. I'll talk more about that soon. Um, and that's where your programs can run. And if you've ever had any experience with it, that's where you can open up the driver station. It'll be coming through the robot controller app and it'll be on two basically smartphones or if you're on a control hub, it's a control hub. And um, that's where you'll be able to run the programs you download it. And so start off Android Studio and built off the IntelliJ IDE. And then you have the FTC SDK that helps you uh, communicate to and really just say, okay, if I want to move this motor, then the FCC SDK gives you the libraries and the functionalities to actually say set power to this motor and you don't have to do any of the dirty work and you just have to basically run a couple, it, it makes life a lot easier. Okay, so Gradle and ADB are with Android Studio, so they're not with FTC SDK, but Gradle and ADB are with Android Studio. Uh, Gradle helps uh, build your project, helps do the compiling part, and also helps do uh, does the runtime part. And so basically, instead of having to do a lot of maybe typing a lot of commands, instead you just press a button, hit play, and I'll be able to uh, kind of send your program over the ADB. And so Gradle helps you basically build your project and then ADB allows you to ship your project from your computer. And usually ADB uh, enables you to, if you're on the same Wi-Fi network as your controller, which is basically uh, always because you're gonna have to use Wi-Fi direct to communicate communicate to a uh, control hub or a robot controller app. Although you can, for your controller app, you can actually plug in a USB. I think for the control hub, you can also plug in a USB and download straight to it. But uh, ADB, regardless of actually wi wireless or wired, ADB is gonna help you send your program you wrote in the FTC SDK or with the power of the FTC SDK onto an app or onto your, your robot. And so ADB assists you to ship your project over. So I think it's, uh, I'm not too sure what ADB stands for, but maybe you can do a quick Google. Uh, no, not Asian Development Bank. Definitely not Asian Development Bank. Oh, Android Debug Bridge. So yeah, to communicate with a device and the device is gonna be a control up or your robot controller app. So by the way, don't ever be afraid to uh, use Google. So robot control up and robot control hub. So it's a Linux operating system. If you don't know what Linux is, or it's completely okay. I guess it's just some background knowledge would be helpful though. So Linux operating systems kind of Linux, you have you kind of hear of Windows operating system, that's probably what you're using right now, or Mac operating system, but there's also another one called Linux. Uh, it's open source compared to Windows, which is commercial. Um, and Linux is basically yeah, it's just another operating system. A lot of developers use it, not only in uh, kind of programming these FCC SDKs, but also uh, you see it in uh, just general software development or even website development or yeah, a lot of things. You see servers being hosted on Linux operating systems and yeah. And so the control hub and Android, your Android smartphone is also actually a Linux, it's built off of a Linux operating system. It's built off a Linux, uh, yeah, operating system. So the Android operating system is kind of, you know, extension of Linux operating system, but for you know, like usually tablets, smart or smartwatches, smartphones, that kind of thing. And so, uh, so you first go from Android Studio, you get your code downloaded and it goes to the robot control app or control hub. And then that's where you also do your robot config. So that's where you might have created a object or you might have created a variable on your Android Studio when you're writing your code on Android Studio. And you're gonna have to use robot config, which is usually on your driver station app, your robot controller app. And you'll basically be saying, this is what this motor is called. And so the port zero motor, so port zero motor, let's see if I can turn my, uh, oh. so port zero motor might be connected to, let's say it might be connected to the front motor. So your, your front right motor. So you can call this motor front right motor in your uh, robot config on your robot controller app or your driver station app. And uh, if you don't know what the robot controller app or driver station app is, it's basically just an app on uh, you download onto a Android phone. Usually they give you kind of details about what phones you can get and which phones are basically allowed for the competition. And um, yeah, so that helps you do your robot config. And so you have zero, one, two, three, you can plug, let's say you can plug a mo another motor in to port one, or you can even plug the servos, servos down here, these six servos slots, or, um, yeah, so LEDs are actually also servos, so you might be plugging LED, you might, who knows what you might be plugging in, but you'll be just telling the robot, um, telling your code what motor is what on the robot config. And so yeah, control hub wiring, that leads right into it. So you might be wiring servo, motors, and so 
what happens? It, to recap it all, like how it gets from your fingers to a motor moving is Android Studio, you write your code, Android Studio, you use Gradle to build it, takes ADB, downloads it onto your robot control app, robot control hub. You make sure you have a robot config on there to tell them that this is what this motor is called. So this is what maybe more motor zero is called. And then that's where your wiring comes in. You make sure everything's wired. And then you go to your driver station app. You might learn, you might, you know, just like this is my program that I want to run. And you run it and then the motor will move. All right. So next slide. So libraries and frameworks, uh, although this is not directly related to FTCS programming, it's pretty close, pretty close tied in. And so you might hear as uh, as you kind of explore FTC uh, or just programming in general about libraries and frameworks. And so libraries are basically additional functionalities to add on to your program. So you can uh, do you can make ta tasks that you might be doing with 100 lines of code. Maybe someone has already invented that part of writing that code and maybe has already simplified the process. And, and so you just import that library and you can use it and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so um, the programmer controls, you know, what libraries you want to use and you can have multiple libraries and some common FTC libraries. Uh, we actually used a couple of these this past year, Roadrunner, OpenCV, Vuforia, and TensorFlow. And so for example, you can take something like OpenCV, which is actually uh, helpful for vision detection. And so if you've ever done FTC, you might know that less or if, that you usually have a task where you have to maybe identify uh, where the location of something is or what uh, for last year's uh, competition, how many rings are stacked. And so you can use something like OpenCV to may, make the process of reading camera input a lot easier and doing analysis on it and processing it and things like that. And so, yeah, uh, library you can see in the bottom, yeah, it has library, kind of gives you functionality to your code, but this is opposed to a framework where it's, uh, it's actually more of you have to follow the framework. Your code has to follow this framework and it's more structured. And um, usually you see this, we don't see it a lot in FTC, but you might see a framework for let's say taking Java and you wanna build a web application. So you might have to follow a framework and the framework can really make your life a lot easier for making something like a web development app or something like that. And so uh, you can think of, yeah. So you can think of building a house analogy if this helps at all, if this doesn't help, then just ignore it. But you can think of a library as let's say you built a house and usually you use your house to, you know, you live in it, you sleep, you eat. Um, but you can think of a library as it gives it additional functionality. Let's say, you, so the library can be like this on the left. So maybe you had a library imported and so this, in this case, in the real world, your library is a pool and a pool shed. And so this gives your house additional functionality. Now you can swim inside your house and that's pretty neat. But you can think of a framework as more of, uh, let's say when you're, you're, uh, you have your house and, and how do you want to construct your house, right? How is a house supposed to be built? What uses are, is a house? What is the house supposed to do? And so you have frameworks and you can see these houses, they all look pretty similar because they might have followed the same framework. And, um, and so maybe they all have a front door that with stairs on it. And you have a couple windows here and there. And you also have an attic. And the framework kind of tells you that this is the structure of your code and this is how it should be constructed. And the programmer follows it. And the framework also additionally makes your life a lot easier um, for maybe communicating to something or uh, building something or something like that. And so uh, yeah, that's the build a house analogy. Hopefully that helped. Um, well, yeah, so in short, libraries give you additional functionalities. And FTC, you'll probably be, uh, as you get later advanced programming, you might see something like Roadrunner, OpenCV as your framework. I mean, as your library, sorry. So some libraries you might use. Oh, also a quick note about Roadrunner. So or actually we'll mention these real quick. So Roadrunner is actually for uh, path planning. And so if you want to make a smooth spline or if you make a smooth spline curve, you can think of a spline as a curve. And if you want to, instead of, so usually you might see a robot that might go forward and turn right, but that might not be efficient, right? So instead you can make a spline that turns the robot and makes it move forward and turns it along the trajectory at the same time. And Roadrunner makes, uh, simplifies that part of uh, movement for your robot. And so OpenCV, Vuforia, TensorFlow, those are all for vision detection. So when you want to maybe detect a yellow block or you want to see how many rings are stacked on top of each other. All right, so we'll also quickly go over version control. Uh, this is, although this doesn't seem very tied into, hmm, why would I need version control for uh, learning how to program, right? So it seems kind of maybe on the side, but version control is actually pretty important. You can imagine what happened if you did not have edit history on your Google Docs. 
or you cannot collaborate on your Google Docs, then that would be kind of annoying, right? And how would you kind of manage your workflow? And so version control or version control system uh, really helps with that. And so you, basically everyone uses Git. And so Git is a version control system and helps, you can think about it as Google Doc edit history. And so you can see something like this, where um, basically what happens is when you, let's say you make a program a robot and you first make a feature that makes it move forward. And so what you want to do is you want to save your work, right? So if your computer explodes or uh, you throw your computer in the pool accidentally, or um, maybe you just, you know, you just want to make sure that you have a saved copy of your uh, code for moving forward. And so you can actually store that. You can uh, use something like Git as a version control system to store that current state of your work into a commit. And then that commit can be put remotely, but we'll just talk about local scope right now. So let's say you save that version and then you go ahead and you make some more changes. And now let's say you make a turning change. But when you're making the turn right functionality or turn left functionality, suddenly you were messing around with your move forward code. And then now that you don't have your turn right, you don't have your turn left and your move forward is all messed up as well. So with Git, you can do something like go back to the previous version and you can edit it. Or you can go back or you can revert to a previous version and you'll still have some progress and you won't lose all your progress. Uh, Git is also used so that you can maybe develop a lot, multiple features alongside the, each other, or you can have one person developing a feature and another person developing a feature. And so you can see this diagram. You've had the master branch, which is like the main branch. And um, that's kind of the branch of where your work goes, right? So you can imagine you have your master and you create your own branch, right? So there's right now there's Oh, right now there's one branch, two branches. And right now there's only one branch. At this point, there's only one branch and there's only one state of your code. And let's say, okay, let's say I wanna add some features, but I don't wanna mess up with the code already previously. So what you do is you create a new branch, you do all your work. So maybe this is some functionalities you've added. Each of the dots represents a commit or something you've done with the code. And eventually you get it all working and you're pretty happy and say, all right, this is ready to put to the main code now. And so you merge it back into the master branch. And so maybe along the way, the master branch made some changes. Excuse me, but master branch makes some changes, but you're still able to merge together and maybe they're working on another thing while you're working on one. Uh, you're working on two different things. Maybe some along the way while you're committing, someone else is also takes makes their own branch, does some work, and then merges back together. And so you can think of it as Git. You can think of Git as this kind of management system. And so you can imagine you may have some project directories and well, this is kind of the commit part, right? So we can actually escape. And so let's say you have file one and you do some changes in your project directory. You say, okay, I want this file to be saved now. I wanna track this file. So what you do is take file one and you use a Git command or Git add specifically, and you get add and you get add onto the staging area. Staging area is saying, okay, this is some code that I want to save. And, but you haven't saved it yet. You just say, I want to track this file. I want to save it. Whatever updates I do, I want to make sure that it's saved. So you say, oh, all right, I'll get add this first file, right? Staging area. And after you're like, okay, maybe don't touch file set two for now. The first file, it's ready to go. And so it's on the staging area and then we can get commit it. So after you get added, you get commit and uh, that's when you commit your code, you say, all right, this is first commit. And then one of these dots can represent your commit, right? So you say, okay, so here's your master branch. You split off to another branch or branch, or you split off to your own branch and you commit it, and this is your commit. And so what happens is uh, actually it gets, uh, you commit it. And so it's actually not in the staging area anymore, but uh, Git stores a version of it. So it actually gets moved kind of, Git, it's not a complete copy. It kind of, this Git folder is not as big as the files. And uh, usually it's a lot more efficient as so you can move this file one into Git. And, but of course you still have the file as, so now Git now knows that this file exists, but you still have the file in your project directory. Also, when you're moving to the staging area, it's still in your project directory, but now Git knows that you want to stage it. Okay, so Git has this file one now, and let's say your project directory, and you do some edits to your file. And it's now, it's file 1.1. And so here's your file 1.1, right? And now you say, all right, I wanna stage this. This is a new change. And so then it moves to the staging area. And then after it moves to the staging area, this might be the next commit and you commit it. And Git now saves this file 1.1 instead of the one. 
But you have to remember, Git is a version control system. So obviously, it still wants to retain the file 1.1. So it, what Git is actually doing is Git stores file 1.1 as well as file 1. So if you ever want to revert to file 1, it'll help you do that. It doesn't store a full copy. I'm pretty sure it just stores the differences in the file, which is a lot more efficient. And so now you have file 1, file 1.1. And, and so uh, yeah, that's basically how Git works. So if you want to revert back, then what it can do is it can retrieve your file 1 version and revert it back. And then you can also, your next commit, you might want to add both files. So then this might turn into file 1.2, version 2, but this file will just be file 2. So it gets moved over here, it gets moved over here, and so on. And so Git is basically, just for your knowledge, I guess for now, is a way to manage your work. Um, and it'll be helpful and we'll do more of it uh, later on into the training weeks. All right, and so this is now the remote part of it. So usually you don't want it only on your computer because if your computer, like I said, maybe flies into the pool or it randomly explodes, hopefully it doesn't. But in case it does, we always want to be kind of kind of prepared for those contingencies as well. Although they might not be that extreme, maybe you just want to be reverting your code. So that's where GitHub comes in and it's a remote version. So it can be stored on GitHub, which is basically on some servers uh, in the cloud, or it can be remote. So you put on a GitHub and then you have a friend, like uh, right here, you have Zenkai and Josh. So Zenkai might have these two project files. He adds them, he commits them, and then he pushes them so that he uh, moves these files to the shared repo. He still has them, of course, but oh, let's, let's try to do better. So now they're on the shared repo after he's kind of used Git as his version, Git and GitHub as his version control system. And so he pushes them to here. And Josh can take it from this shared repo and he'll take the files as well. And he can uh, put them in his project repo. He might do some edits. So now it's file 1.1 and file 2.1. And so he can take these files and he can also send them over to the shared repo and you can get the idea. So the shared repo will still store the version one or the very first original files, but also store version one. And Zenkai can also take the file 1.1 and 1. or 2.1. So we can just imagine that these have been changed to file 1.1 2.1, but they also still have the version history. And then Zenkai can get pull, and then he'll be able to get these versions as well. And so you can see how this kind of helps manage workflow. All right, so that's about it for Git. And if you guys remember, if you guys have any questions, we'll probably be posting this. So you can always feel free to contact us, or uh, if it's on YouTube or Facebook, you can just like leave a comment or something. All right, so programmer's task. So what is, for all this knowledge about JDK, the Java development environment, uh, or the JRE, the Java runtime environment, and like programming and libraries and frameworks and Git and GitHub, you know, I have to ask, what is a programmer's task? So programmer's task is you wanna make sure you have reusable modular code. You might wonder why modular is so weirdly spaced and, um, and it's because a lot of times you see, uh, for our team at least, uh, our team's code is not maybe that reusable and modular and it's kind of running inside joke. But uh, hopefully this upcoming year we'll be able to make it modular. And what is modular, right? And so modular is this idea that you can take some code and it's easily reusable, but it can still have lots of functionalities. And um, you don't have to type, like, lo type lots of code and the code is clean and easy to understand. And uh, it, it's, it's usable. It's, it's like um, if you're building a, it's kind of like the hardware aspect too. You want to be able to build mechanisms that are, uh, you can adapt them to different tasks, but you can still, uh, you can still, if they're still easy to manage. And so, uh, yeah, I think code management is a big part. Uh, making modular code allows you to manage your code easily. And so that's kind of a programmer's task. We'll be getting into more than that later. And so that might be just as a quick example that making your code modular might be instead of uh, writing a couple, maybe five lines to move forward, instead you write one method and that one method can be used over basically anything. And I, let's say that method is to move forward. And that method also, it may be, if you only have that method move five inches, then what if you want to move four inches or 10 inches or 15 inches? Then, so not only you make that method take five lines of code and uh, you make it modular by putting it in one method. And so if you wanted to change how you move forward, instead of having to go through your code and looking for every instance where you use that five, six lines to move forward, you just go to one spot, you change it that one place. And since every other place uses that modular code, 
and then those places get automatically updated and you don't have to worry about it. Um, and that keeps it modular. And, and you can imagine how it can be a lot more helpful if uh, that modular code also can take parameters or arguments, or basically you can take an option of, let's say, instead of moving five inches, you pass an option and it can move 10 or 12 or 20. And so that makes it reusable. And so programmer's task is be able to create this code and honestly create it so easily that not only can you understand it, if you don't look in it, if you look at it and um, you don't have to look at, uh, if you look at it, uh, wait, not a restart. So, so hopefully it'll be so modular and so reusable and so understandable that not only that you look at it six months later and say, okay, this is what I understand. And if you wanna build, add additional features, it'll be easy. But other people like other programmers or even other team members can look at it and kind of gain a little base understanding of what's happening. All right, so a uh, programmer also wants to for autonomous create efficient paths with multiple max scores and multiple paths with multiple tasks. So, you know, you want efficient paths so you can get high scores into a competition competition and multiple paths. The idea is when they go back to in person, hopefully, or if you guys already have been back in person, um, that you don't want your robot to collide. So collision prevention as well. So you want to be able to do multiple things. Let's say your teammates robot can only do A, B, C. So you can also do, and you'll be able to do D, E, F. Or if they can only do A, C, E, then you be able to do B, D, F, and multiple paths, multiple tasks. And then colliding collision prevention, that's just making sure, you know, uh, maybe let's say uh, you see, so collision prevention can be as simple as saying, okay, talking with your teammates and are talking with your lines, making sure your paths don't collide or um, it can be as advanced as saying, maybe even trying to detect a robot that's on its path, or once it you can see the robot that has some resistance, it stops moving and it waits and uh, hopes that the other robot has moved out by then. And so, uh, or even reassigning its path, which is even crazier if you think about it. And so that's for autonomous, for teleop, you wanna make sure that your programs allow the drivers to have intuitive controls on the robot and you work with the drivers, so you know you kind of have make sure that they're getting the best experience and they can be scoring high during teleop and also making automated features whenever possible. So making a task with robot error being much lower than human error would be awesome. And also finally, you know, you're gonna keep all your programs consistent, whether that means autonomous is consistent or, or your teleop just doesn't randomly break all the time. All right, so. That's about it for lecture. It might have been pretty long. If you guys have any questions, then you know, make sure to put them in chat or put them in the comment section or whatever. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll move on to the lab. All right. So today we'll just be setting up our development environment. And for, as for the hello world of the project, we'll kind of just be walking through all the different uh, uh, files that they've provided, examples they've provided, as well as what like an op mode is or a hardware push button. Okay. So. Uh, what we'll need to download, we're gonna have to download Java Joe and JDK, uh, as we talked about, the Android Studio and the FCC SDK. And you might have potential path variable changes, but I think it's unlikely. So first we wanna go to Java JDK download soon. You can either, uh, we'll be sharing the slides, so you can either click on this link over here or you can just do a quick JDK download search. And we can go to the first result, hit go to download and JDK download, and then it will pick the Windows version. And uh, if you have a Mac or Linux, then just make sure to pick that version. Actually, Linux, you probably want to be using your command line. So I think it would just be like sudo apt install. Uh, I forgot the exact command, but I think if you just run Java command, if you just type Java, it will give you some options. And I think it's going to be something like open or I mean, like, or uh, yeah, no, you can just do some Googling and uh, yeah, actually, yeah, we'll help you. Actually, I doubt that anyone has a Linux computer. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll just go with the Windows option. Actually, we'll do, we know while we're waiting. Uh, Java, J oh, let's hit. Okay, so Java, JDK, Ubuntu, install. I think most people probably have Ubuntu. Let's, uh, let's see. Oh, open JDK. So yeah, probably something like, sudo apt get install open jdk dash actually probably not eight so probably like dash 16 uh dash jdk or something like that okay um let's go ahead and go through the installment so I'll hit next i'm giving a second this might take a while um yeah i'll 
you can probably just, I'll probably, okay, oh, okay, well, that was pretty fast. All right, so that's JDK. Now we're gonna install Android Studio. So you can either click on that link or search up Android Studio download. And you can just go to the go to download button and download Android Studio. All right, actually we'll go download Android Studio right here. Scroll to the bottom, you know, accept and open it when it's done. Give it like, yeah, 20, 30 seconds. Go ahead and close this tab. Probably wouldn't need it anymore. And also to check if you have Java installed or if uh, to make sure that your installation worked correctly. Um, probably should have mentioned this earlier. Sorry about that. Okay, this is actually really big. Here, let me let me size down my text. <laughs> um, let's go to 14. Oh, nope, that's a bit small. Let's go to 16. All right. That's good. Okay, so you can check if. Uh, I mean, so usually it'll look like this and you can just type Java dash version to see if you have Java installed. And as we just installed Java, so as you can see, we're good. Um, however, if you, you actually probably should have done this before because if you already had a Java version uh, that's like 14 and higher, I'd say, then you'd probably be fine. And so and you just do run Java dash version and then you'll be able to see if you have Java installed. If the command line says that it can't find the Java keyword or something like that, that means you don't have it installed. So you should make sure to install it. All right, so now uh, we can close that and let's go to Android Studio. So we download install, let's just hit next. Um, we actually don't need a virtual uh, device because we'll be just always downloading code, but if you want to keep it then that's great. But I'll just not install it and then I'll hit next and we can create our shortcuts and we'll give it a second. And so while this is installing, uh, pretty fast actually, but it might take some time for you. You want to go to the FTC SDK, the software development kits for you to write code in for the FTC first tech challenge. And so you can also just search up, you can click on this link, which links you to, you just Google FTC robot controller, click on the first link, so it should look like something like this. Um, and then you'll just go to the code right here, the screen button, and you'll download the zip. And then when you download the zip, you should be able to just extract the zip. So I think I already have it downloaded. Uh, let's see. So you'll be able to extract the zip and it'll be like a folder and it'll look something like this and it'll have all this kind of stuff in it. But FTC robot controller dash master. And if you don't know how to extract the zip, <laughs> uh, let's see if, okay, no worries, but it'll probably just be something like this. And then you could like press extract here or something like that, but it shouldn't be too difficult. Hopefully you'll know how to do it because um, yeah, just, uh, okay. So now we can see that Android Studio has finished setting up. And so I'm gonna go ahead and start Android Studio and there it loads. All right, I'll give it a second. First time starting up might take a bit. And it already loaded my project, but usually it won't load your project. So we'll go ahead and close the project. And so when you open it up, it probably should look something like this. And so we can go ahead and import project. And then you go over to wherever you installed it. So make sure you know where you installed it. And then um, you'll click on it. There might be a folder in a folder. You want to make sure that you're clicking on the green dude right here, this green guy, not this one, not this one, but the like uh, highest, most green little logo. Hit okay. So FTC robot controller master and it'll load up, uh, it'll load up. Uh, yeah, let's close the zips. A lot of the project in Android Studio. So it'll probably look like this. You might have to give it some time. If you look in your bottom right of your Android Studio, you'll if there's a task running, you'll probably have to wait. It might be like Gradle build, it might be like indexing, it might it could be anything. It might even be downloading some updates for your Android Studio. And so um yeah, you can just you know wait. Uh, and also another note is you probably, if you have a later version of Android Studio, I would suggest probably updating it. So if you already downloaded it, <laughs> I'm probably saying these things a bit too late, but if you have like maybe Android 2.0, like the 2.0 version, the current version right now is like 4.2.2, but, uh, yeah, so 4.2.1, 
but you probably want to have the most updated version. So yeah, 4.2.2. If you have something like two or three, yeah, or even the, yeah, I recommend you upgrade it. And so here is Android Studio. Also, I also realized that you might have, you might go be, you might have some steps that you, okay, so I actually had Android Studio installed and I uninstalled it after, but if you had some options to do, like before it would just load up like this, uh, you could basically just choose next, next, next. And I think, um, yeah, you could basically just you know spam next through all of them but there might have an option to change it from light mode to dark mode so yeah as you can see yours might be white but mine's already dark i think it's because previous settings were still installed but okay so now that we're here here is our folder and we can go ahead and you may notice hey here's gradle that helps us build our stuff but the two folders that we really care about everything else is you know we don't have the library gradle doc i think and these dot files you or dot folders you don't really have to worry about. And so you can open up the FTC robot controller. And this is where uh, you'll actually find. So if you open up, okay, let's back up. FTC robot controller, the SRC fol source folder. And then we open up main and then Java. And then it'll open up org first and finders, FTC robot controller. And then here's your external samples. You don't really have to run internal, but external samples is where they give you some samples for how to do some things and we'll look into that later and before we look into that so that's fcc robot controller we also want to make sure to look into our team code so team code is where your team will be running your code and this is usually where most teams write their code so you go into team code source and then main and then open up all this and inside this very last folder team code and you can read the remote this is where you will paste your code for your team's robot controller app and so uh here it is so you can read through the readme and uh yeah you can just yeah you're gonna take a look through it uh but we'll go ahead and move to the examples now let's see, see some of their stuff hardware push button. okay so talking about hardware push bot, let's go take a look at their hardware push bot. and so here's their hardware push bot. um you can see that if you don't understand this completely fine this is java we'll be doing a java crash course but you can hopefully read a little bit of it, understand a bit. So there's this class called the hardware push button. Hardware push button is the basic bot, the basic robot where it, 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 you can think of a push bot as a term of a, the basic kind of robot that just ha does some simple functionalities like move around. It might have a two wheel drive and move around and maybe have a claw or arm or something like that. And so the hardware push bot, this file is actually where you connect. So you, we talked about how Android Studio goes to your robot control hub and your control hub uh, has robot config where you say that this motor is this name. The hardware push bot is where it links the rest of your other files, the rest of your other files, which might be a teleop that you can con drive control the robot or autonomous where the robot moves. This file links the names of each motor that you might have con configured on your robot config to a certain another variable. So we can take a look at that. So you can see that there's these left drive, right drive, left arm, left claw variable names. So these are variable names. And they have these types. And we talked about the static dynamic type. So the type of these objects is a motor. So you might imagine if you have a left drive, it's going to be a motor. Or of arm, it might be a motor. And uh, you also have a servo. So a uh, servo, you can you know open and close the claw. Uh, by the way, if you don't know if the difference between a motor and servo, motor is basically it just continuously spins. Um, and a servo is something that kind of only goes, has a restrained motion, unless you have a continuous rotation servo. But usually motors are for like driving and you know, servo can be for a claw. And so remember you only have limited slots. So you have six servo slots and four motor slots. And so you can see this is where inside this hardware push point, you can kind of scroll past some of it. And here's the left drive. So you says this left drive object equal to hardware map, or you can just ignore it, but this HW map is the hardware map. And it basically says this left drive is gonna be set to whatever on the robot configuration is called left underscore drive. Right drive is set to right drive, left arm is set to left arm. And you can see the same happens for a servo. But you might notice since these are DC motors, that you see motor.class and servo servo.class. And so, yeah, that's a hardware push bot. Hardware push bot links names of stuff on your robot configuration to variable names that you can use in the rest of your programs. And so you might think, what other variable, pro what other programs we, we might use? So one of them is the pushbot, teleop. All right, so here's the pushbot teleop. And so the teleop is 
kind of, maybe let's break this down some more. So you can see in the past, hardware pushbot was kind of just a hack class called hardware pushbot. And it had some variables here, left drive, right drive, left arm, left claw. And so then eventually they got assigned to these control hub names. And if you don't understand this out of right now, it's completely fine. We'll be covering this next lesson. So this is the pushbot teleop POV linear. So teleop that helps you, you know, move your robot around. If you press something on the joystick, it'll uh, it'll move. By the way, uh, for FTC, we use a joystick to control the robot. And so you can see, um, let's see, yeah, let's break it down. So this is the hardware pushbot. We're using that hardware pushbot. This is and you can just imagine we created that object, that robot object, which has these properties of this left drive, this right drive, this this left arm and so on. And so we create that robot. And then when we run op mode, so you can think of run op mode as run the teleop. When we run the teleop, we, uh, we have some variables here, but we can just ignore them for now. We initialize the hardware map. So we say, all right, let's do some linking. Say this hardware, this part of the robot is linked. This motor is called this and so on. And it links all of it together. And so then we wait for the start. So right before you put, press the play, uh, it waits, and then once you press the play, it runs this while loop. It runs a continuous loop, right? It runs a continuous loop while the op mode is active. So while it's playing, and when you press the stop button, op mode does not is not active anymore. But it runs this continuous while loop, and so it does things when the so it sets power. So you can imagine this is probably probably can't understand right now, but you can just imagine it sets power to the robot, the left drive of the motor based off of this left variable, which is actually based off your joystick movement and sets power to the right one based off your joystick. And uh, it does a bunch of other things, but you can just mainly ignore them for now, but you can just imagine it took the hardware pushbot configuration and now you're running a tally up with all this code. And so here is the linear. So this is a tally up, but uh, we can also take a look at an autonomous. So push while auto or autonomous drive by, it's not to encoder, let's do by time. So we, and we'll talk about localization methods really quickly after this, but you can see that through here, there's another hardware push bot robot that has been created. And it also has a run op mode, but this time it's a bit different. So after the way first start, you don't wanna continuously loop through checking if you've moved the joystick and then setting power, right? You don't wanna do some, infinite loop because hard you basically for autonomous what happens is you want to you have 30 seconds you run some movement and then you stop and if you don't finish within 30 seconds you're basically gonna have to the robot will stop itself or try to stop itself or um yeah so you you basically just want to run some instructions to 30 seconds and so you can imagine uh it has no while loop so it does not actually keep on looping through things and checking if you've moved the joystick. And additionally, if you don't want to move the joystick and have it do something, because it's not supposed to be driver controlled, uh, autonomous, right? And so you have to be, the robot has to be autonomous. All right, <clears throat> so you can see that the robot still sets powers, but now it does, uh, it looks a bit different. So it still sets the power with this forward speed variable, but this time it, um, yeah, so it, instead it uh, doesn't go through a loop, it just does it for three seconds, one spins right for one second and so on. And so, yeah, so you can imagine the hardware push pot is still used in here. So the hardware push pot is used to connect the these variables like robot.left drive to actual motors and set power. And so there you have it. So you have the teleop, you have the autonomous, you have your push pot. And you notice when these are linear. So linear is actually a bit different than another kind of op mode we have. So you can see extends linear op mode. There's also the iterative op mode. So if we open that up here, so uh, yeah, I think there's an iterative one here. So you can see in iterative, it's a bit different. It runs one thing, so you can iterative, it creates the hardware push mod still, but when you press in it, it runs one thing and then code to run repeatedly. So it's iterative, so it iterates, it loops. So after code runs repeatedly after the driver hits in it, but before they hit play, and then the code they run once after it hits play, and then code repeatedly after the driver hits play, but before they hit stop. So they have kind of these loops that are constantly running. So instead of that while loop that you might have seen here, so uh, over here, you might have seen a while op mode is active. Instead now they have just an init loop. And we'll get more into depth of this later, but you should just know that there's two types of linear, which is basically, you know, just go down once or you have a loop 
And then you can think of like an autonomous, so you just go down once. But a uh, linear can be both for autonomous and teleop. Iterative can be both for autonomous and teleop. But you can think of iterative, <laughs> iterative it iterates, and linear is more just time based. You know, you just go down and you kind of just run continuous. Uh, yeah, and an iterative is a lot more. You know, you have you have a couple more methods, but they both essentially, if you take any linear op mode, you can turn it iteratively. And a lot of people don't really use iterative, and they just most we just have there's just a general preference for using uh, linear op modes. And so, yeah, and you can see this. This is just okay. So uh, mainly you have the teleop, the push watt, auto push watt, auto drive. And you might have seen by trial, by time, to line, those kind of things. And um, that's going to be about it. You can feel free to take a look at any of these files. We'll be doing more uh, Java teaching next week, and then we'll get into this next, next week. But um, yeah, so that's about it for this part. We'll quickly go back to slides, wrap things up, and that'll be it. So uh, we did all the setup. We were able to get Android Studio launched. and. <coughs> And get the Java JDK and FTC SDK downloaded, but to actually, you know, move the robot and everything in later weeks, you'll probably also need a robot controller app and those kind of things. I'll probably show you how to set it up as well. All right, so uh, that's it, and let's move on to localization systems. So we'll do a little bit more talking, and then we'll be done. So localization systems is basically how do you keep track of your robot, right? And so the idea is there's a couple ways. So you first can, you know, use time to move or to localize. So you can say, move forward for five seconds, or you can use encoders, where it might be something like move forward so that your encoder on your motor, which measures the amount of ticks, or basically how much it turns, measures like the revolutions of a, well, you basically convert it to measure revolutions. We'll be talking more about that later. And it basically requires a bit of math and that's about it. But encoders can say, all right, move this many ticks, which converts to this many inches and then stop. So time is like move for five seconds. Encoders is like move for five inches. And dead wheels is kind of an extension of encoders where you have these wheels that are not, the encoders are usually tied to the motor of your moving wheel, right? But instead of doing that, uh, you actually make these dead wheels or the wheels that don't give any power. And the whole purpose is to just count encoder ticks. And the benefit of this is, let's say you have your motors driving, right? And you hit a wall. Well, the, the wheels are going to keep on turning still, but it's not going to be going anywhere. So it's going to be basically inaccurate. Or let's say you're going up, uh, like, about, like uh, maybe you, you hit something or hit another robot or hit a hump or anything. Um, it's, it can, the motor encoders can, um, the motor encoder, the motors can still turn, but it'll just be stuck in one place. And when you try backing up or something, it'll make it actually inaccurate because the motor thinks that it went forward, but it actually just got stuck. So dead wheels kind of solve that problem. Dead wheels, if you just don't put any power onto them and you just, and they just rotate by themselves when the robot actually moves, then you'll be able to kind of reduce this inaccuracy. All right, so finally a vision. So vision is a great, another great localization system. Um, you can basically just, you know, let's say you might have seen the images. So they provide images on the FTC walls and you can use those to localize, or maybe you'll be using it, the vision. So you know that a certain object is somewhere. Maybe in this past season, you knew that the rings were always gonna be, the star stack is always in the same place. So you use a camera and you can kind of, by looking at where the rings are supposed to be, you can kind of get a sense of where you are or where you are localized or located on the field. And field boundaries are also a great localization system, although they can be inefficient sometimes. Simply just ramming your robot against the side of a wall can help you reset maybe your encoders or your dead wheels or vision, or you can just, if you tell your robot to basically go all the way to the left and you'll definitely guarantee that your robot will be right up against the wall when you stop moving for let's say let's say you know that your robot can transfer go across half the field in like five seconds and or let's say you can go across the, the whole field in like 10 seconds and so if you have a, a a command that just says move 10 seconds and then to the left you'll know that your robot has to be at the edge. So then you technically, now your robot knows where you are and you can basically make movements off that. So you can imagine, um, let's say your encoders might have went off a bit and you don't have dead wheels. So what you do is you go all the way to the left and uh, you know that you're always, and so this might be during autonomous, right? So you move all the way to the left or you hit the side, ram the side of the wall to realign yourself and do some more movement. Or maybe it might not even be the left. Maybe you hit all the way to the left and then you back up. So now you're in a corner, which is even better localization. But the, of course, the 
kind of thing you have to take into account with the field boundaries is you're gonna have to spend time moving and you're gonna spend time uh, realigning. So uh, field boundaries really aren't that optimal unless you're already kind of close to an edge or something like that. And of course you don't wanna be ramming your robot too much against the wall or ramming too fast and, or you might break something or you might damage the wall and that won't be great. So here are the localization systems. And we'll do a quick summary, and that's about it. So today we covered programming and Java overviews. We talked about object-oriented programming. We talked about the JDK, JRE, JVM. Uh, we also talked about compiler, runtime, and we talked about even typing, right, static and dynamic typing, and how if you create a variable, you have to tell them what type it is. So you can see, like here, when you created the hardware push bot, you had to say, all right, this is a DC motor, or this is a servo. And so we also talked about Android Studio, SCC, SDK, Control Hub, kind of the how it gets from your fingers to the motors, from your fingers typing to the motors moving. We talk about libraries and frameworks and some that we use in FTC. So the Roadrunner, OpenCV, Foia, TensorFlow. And we talked about Git. So as a version control system, as well as programmer tasks. So what you have to do as a programmer, kind of things that they count, making efficient paths or working with your drivers for teleop. And then finally, we set up our development environment and explored the FTC SDK with uh, looking at Harvard Pushbot and the op modes and things like that. And we finally took a quick look at localization systems. So how we can know where a robot is or how we can move. So time, encoders, dead wheels. Oh, and one thing we actually did not mention. One thing that I just remembered just now. So it's not on this list, but I'll quickly add it here. It's the gyro. So you can use your gyro. So your control hub actually has an inbuilt measurement device to measure where you are headed in all three directions. So you can imagine uh, if you turn to the right, it will know that you turned maybe 90 degrees and you can kind of align based on that. So you can make you basically build methods that say, turn 90 degrees and make sure you're pointing towards a certain direction. It actually looks in three, all, all three axes, axes but if you think about it, your robot will never be kind of looking down and up. It'll never be doing that. It'll, only be turning left, right, in this plane of direction or this axis, right? You also, so you got, you got looking up and down. You'll probably never do that. Uh, you got left and right, which will do probably a lot. And uh, what's the, so you got going this way, going this way. Uh, I'm forgetting, what, kind of having a brain mind blanking right now, but there's a, oh yeah, and, and then this way, right? So you could be looking down, up, down, left, right. And you'll also be kind of a, uh, wait, what? Okay, so left, right, up, all right. Uh, but you can, what is it? So you'll be up, down, left, right. Oh yeah, yeah, and you'll be tilting like this, it's like this. So up, down, left, right, and you'll be tilting this side up and like this. But you'll never, your robot hopefully will never be tilting like this or never be going like this. So you'll only be looking left, right. And so that's your gyro. So you can use your gyro for basically turning and making clean turns like 90 degree turns or things like that. All right, so yeah, so the localization systems and for learning more, uh, we'll be going to Java next week. But if you guys are interested, I really recommend this YouTube tutorial that um, the new boss in. So this actually helped me with my first time learning Java. I watched his tutorials, there's like 87 videos. So you can just search up Java in Boston and you can take a look through these. I, and I think basically the first 40 are pretty good. And you can, or actually a lot of them are pretty good, but you can just make sure to take a look at all of them if you feel free to. And oh, it's a pretty good set of tutorials. Although it's all old, it's still pretty helpful. All right. And so yeah, that's it about it for today. Thank you guys for coming. And uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact us at wolfcorporobotics12525 at gmail.com. And yeah, thank you all for watching and hopefully you guys all have a great day and keep on learning.